In this video, we'll be discussing what PCB buildups and stackups are and how to design them or choose them properly. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. If you'd like to give Altium Design a, a try for yourself, they're offering a free trial if you go to the link altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab. I also have a pretty long, less than three hour guide on how to use Altium Designer from project creation to getting your board ordered. So I'd recommend you check that out and give the free trial a go. To start with, let's look at the PCB buildup. Essentially, the PCB buildup is the physical construction of the printed circuit board and its layers. In essence, we have a few different material types in a printed circuit board, which make up the layers of a PCB, and we can mainly split those in copper and dielectric materials. A typical buildup might be seen over here for a four layer board, where we might have a copper layer at the top, then we have some sort of dielectric material, an inner copper layer, a core material, which is also a dielectric material, another copper layer, dielectric, and copper. So you can see between every copper layer, we have either air, top and bottom of the boards, or some sort of dielectric material. On the right, you can also see the thicknesses, and we can also see the material types. So a buildup essentially tells us and tells the manufacturer how we want our PCB to be assembled, with which materials and which thicknesses. We need to consider primarily the layer count, so this could be a two, four, six, many, many layer PCBs, the dielectric materials, and these are different prepregs and cores, and we'll talk about what these are. And then we also have to choose copper files. So we can choose different copper thicknesses, and these depend on if they're outer layers or inner layers. As always with PCB design, we want to consider manufacturability and how important it is to actually communicate with your PCB manufacturer of choice. When it comes to choosing or deciding on a buildup, there are many other factors that come into play. For example, what IPC class you might want if using high density interconnect or HDI for short, various things depending on via aspect ratios, controlled impedance, surface finishes, and so on. Let's start off with the easiest. This is the layer count. Essentially, our layer count is defined by our product type, our routing constraints, our density, package types, power delivery requirements, and so forth. These days, typically, you would want to go with at least a four-layer board for most designs, unless they're very, very simple, and then you go with a two-layer board. But a four-layer board is fairly close in price to a two-layer board these days anyway. The layer count constrains the overall minimum thickness of the printed circuit board. So for anything up to about eight or ten layers, you can get away with using just a standard 1.6 millimeter thick printed circuit board. But as soon as you approach 12 or more layers, your PCB is going to have to get thicker because of all of that extra dielectric materials, copper files, and so forth. Layer count and what layers we assign for some ground power or signal needs to be taken into careful consideration when we reach the stack up stage of our PCB design. As we saw previously, we have copper, we have prepreg, and we have core layers in our PCB buildup. Let's start off with prepreg, which is a type of dielectric material. In essence, it's a layer of fiberglass impregnated with resin, for example, FR4. The main defining factors of this prepreg, so this layer, which is between copper layers, is the dielectric constant, or relative permittivity, and its thickness. Now, there are many different types of prepregs, and here's a small list of some of the most popular ones, so 1080, 2116, and so forth. And these will have different available thicknesses, and this depends on your PCB manufacturer, but they'll also have different dielectric constants. Now these dielectric constants depend on the weave, they depend on which direction you're routing, it depends on what frequency, but you always get these nominal quotes. So for 2116 you might get 4.25, and for type 7628 you might get 4.6. In PCBs you will also have core materials, and core materials are also dielectrics, but they have copper files sandwiched essentially on either side. So the PCB manufacturers will get pre-made cores, so where the copper files have already been attached to the core dielectric material, and so they will always have this sort of form. So copper, dielectric, copper. So same as the prepreg, these are defined by electric constant, and this is usually around 4.6, but remember to check your PCB manufacturer specifications. Cores come in various different standard sizes. For example, from this PCB manufacturer, I have them in 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0.8 millimeters, with various copper thicknesses either side. As the last type of layer in our buildup, we essentially have a copper layer. And this is typically a copper file, which is defined primarily by some sort of copper weight or thickness. So thickness is typically given in micrometers and the weight is typically given in ounces per square foot. Now the available copper weights and thicknesses depend on outer versus inner layers. Inner layers will typically have a pretty thin copper file, typically a one ounce max, and usually they'll be about half an ounce thick. Whereas for outer layers, so the top and bottom layers of a PCB, you can go up to even something like eight ounces, if not more. 
And of course, the main deciding factor for a copper file is the actual current handling capability. So if I increase essentially by increasing my thickness for the same trace width, I'm increasing my trace area. And this allows me to have a greater current handling capability for a given temperature rise. Now I've used a simple calculator to, to figure out, okay, for a one millimeter trace on an outer layer, and we're allowing 20 degrees C temperature rise, for, for a half ounce thick trace, we get 1.9 amps, and for one ounce thick trace, we get 3.2 amps. Now, given that we know the basics of what makes up a PCB buildup, the most important part is actually the manufacturability and always talking to your PCB manufacturer. So this could either be checking out which different PCB manufacturers you can see and ask what their standard N layer buildup is. So if you're looking for an eight layer board, you'll send an email or phone your manufacturer and ask them, okay, what is manufacturer for these layer count and for these requirements? Now, if you need something different, so a different stack up, which they might not have standard, you should ask what materials they have in stock, so what prepregs, what properties, and so forth, and maybe suggest a build up based on your needs and ask if this is manufacturable. But it's preferable to always go with what your PCB manufacturer is used to making. So, for a recent design of mine, I required a 10 layer stack up. I communicated with the manufacturer and I said, okay, I need 10 layers. I have a desired impedance for target track width. I had a pretty high density design with fairly fine pitch BGAs, DDR3 memory, and so on. So I required about a 0.1 millimeter track width to give me about 50 ohms single ended impedance. I also gave them my differential requirements, for example, 100 ohm differential with a certain track spacing track width. Nicely enough, the manufacturer should and will usually calculate these track widths for you. So this is what I got back from the manufacturer I had contacted. So I asked for eight and 10 layer buildup. Here you can currently see the eight layer buildup that they sent back to me. Impedance controlled, 50 ohms single ended and 100 ohms differential. And I wanted a target track width to be about 0.1 millimeters to give me 50 ohm signal ended because of my routing density and I had to fit between vias and very fine pad pitches. So you can see I have my stack up here, my top layer up here, my bottom layer down here, and all of these inner layers of this buildup. Copper layers, prepreg, copper, core, and so forth. Now I have various thicknesses over here and I have my dielectric constants over here. And this is really useful because I can import this directly into my ECAD tool and this is the stack up they came up with. So you can see also the prepreg names and so forth. They also delivered, and this is just one example, the required track widths for given impedance and different types of traces. So I have, for example, differential microchip lines, strip lines, and so forth. And this is all the information they provided. You can see here for target impedance of about 100 ohms, I got 100 microns or 0.1 millimeter track width, and they have me a trace separation of 0.2 millimeters. So it's always important, again, to talk to your manufacturer because they know best. Here we are in Alton Designer, and this is a fairly recent design of mine, which is basically a Xilinx Zinc based design, has DDR3 memory, QSPI, EMMC, and a Zinc system on chip. It's a fairly complicated design, and, had, and I ended up going with about 10 layers, a lot of them, of course, ground and power. But the way to import the build up is to go to Design, Layer Stack Manager, and this will open this view over here. And this is a very similar view we should know now. And in essence, all I need to do is take my manufacturer's data and then type that in here. So I can type in my layer name. I can choose what type of layer it is, the copper weight, thickness, and so forth, as well as my dielectric constants over here. We'll get to this later, but you can also see what stack up I'm using. Remember, stack up is different to build up. But what's also nice in Altium is that I can actually import impedance profiles as well. So if I go down here and click on impedance, you can see I've already defined two impedance profiles, and this is from the data I got from the manufacturer. So I have my single ended 50 ohm line over here, and I'm targeting about 0.1 or 0.12 millimeters. And Altium quite nicely, every time I change this width here, will recalculate the impedance. And the same thing for the differential pair, I have my differential 100 ohm lines with a certain width and a certain spacing. And this is the impedance that Altium calculates for me. Now, Altium's calculator is great, but I would of course trust the manufacturers more because they know the exact specs. If we go to jlcpcb.com and you'll find this on any PCB manufacturer's site, there's still gonna be some sort of capabilities and build up stack up section. So I'm on the capabilities site over here and jlcpcb only does to six layer boards. So for the four and six layer boards, they'll have some sort of default stack up. So if I can click on that, it's a controlled impedance stack up. They'll tell you all about the prepreg types, the dielectric constants, and so forth. And if I go down, I can actually choose various thicknesses of the PCB. I always pretty much go with a 1.6 millimeter thick PCB, but you can change that here and see how the core thickness changes, and also the prepreg type and thicknesses and so forth. And they have that also for a six layer PCB.
And again, you can find this information on pretty much every PCB manufacturer site or just send them an email. Next, let's move on to the stack up. In comparison to the build up, the stack up is more concerned with the electrical type of each layer in the PCB. So not concerned about material thicknesses predominantly or what dielectrics you're using, but rather what layers are dedicated to what. For example, these could be signal layers, these could be ground layers, or they could be power layers. So signal layers containing traces, sometimes rooted power, ground layers being a completely solid, dedicated ground plane for reference to the signal layers, and a power plane being either a solid continuous power plane of a certain voltage or several islands or copper pores of various different voltage levels. In essence, before routing a PCB, we want to determine our stack up, which first depends, of course, on the number of layers we have available, and then we want to go through one by one, assigning ground, power, or signals to individual layers. So if we have an eight-layer board, we need to do that for eight layers. Combinations are, of course, also possible, so we can mix power and ground, or signal ground, or signal and power. So let's go through the layer types first of all. One of the most important layer types is the ground layer, and we'll see later why. Ground is essentially used as a reference plane or a layer for signal traces and as well as power traces or pores. This is because for every forward path we need a return path to complete essentially the loop. The second layer type is the power or PWR layer for short, and this is for power distribution. For low speed and low bandwidth systems, this isn't entirely critical and you can route your power with traces. However, power traces become increasingly important for power delivery for high speed circuits. Another feature is that if coupled with a ground layer on an adjacent plane, these form some sort of parallel plate capacitor. Lastly, we have our signal layer where we will route our traces, essentially our forward path, and we'll use a ground predominantly or even a power layer as a reference for our return path. The question now is, how do we sensibly assign layer types in a PCB? Sensibly meaning we have certain goals. We want a systematic approach to deciding a stack up. We don't want to arbitrarily assign different layer types. We want to ensure good EMC or EMI performance. We want to ensure good signal integrity and finally ensure good power delivery. There are a couple golden rules I explain here in brief detail. At AC, so somewhere in the region of a couple of kilohertz, the return path is not the shortest path, but rather the path directly underneath the forward path. So if a, a trace on the top on a signal layer and a ground plane connected below, Essentially, the forward path is on the signal layer, and the return path is directly below that trace in the ground plane beneath. Another thing to consider is that the energy, the signal energy, flows in the dielectric space between the copper. So the signal energy doesn't flow in this plane here, on this plane here. If we look at some sort of side view, if we have a signal trace and a ground reference plane below, assuming a dielectric material in between, we have electric field coupling here, as well as magnetic field coupling, which isn't shown in this image. The copper, therefore, is simply a waveguide. So for good signal integrity and EMI, we need to consider both the forward and the return path, as well as where the energy is flowing and how it is bounded between the forward and return paths. In essence, we want close coupling between signal and ground planes and power and ground planes to prevent these coupling fields from spreading too far. For us, this means our main goal is to avoid fields from spreading. Spreading fields means pretty bad things. For instance, coupling from signal to signal, which leads to crosstalk. Spreading fields also means some form of radiation, which leads to EMI and so forth. So how do we avoid fields from spreading? And how do we contain these fields? The main thing you need to worry about is that every forward signal or power plane needs a closely coupled reference, and preferably ground, of course. For high speed or high energy signals, it makes sense to also use strip line instead of micro strip. Strip line meaning this image down here, we have a signal sandwiched between two ground planes. So we have nice field coupling from the signal to both ground planes either side. As we talked about before, an additional point to consider is adjacent power and ground planes. So for example, here we have a ground plane, we have some sort of dielectric with a thickness D, and we have a power plane. If we think back to a parallel plate capacitor and the equation for that, it is the permittivity times the area divided by the distance. So if we make the distance D very small, so we bring the ground and power planes closer together, we can actually increase their capacitance. And this is great for us because this gives us improved power delivery at high frequencies. And this is something that's really important, for example, in FPGA designs or high bandwidth interface designs. As an example, let's look at a four layer stack up. This is a four layer stack up you will see in many hobbyist boards and even some industry boards as well. This is considered some sort of standard four layer stack up. On the top layer, we have a signal layer. The first internal layer is a ground layer. 
Then we have a power layer on the second internal ground layer, and on the bottom layer, we have a signal layer. The question is, why isn't that great? Thinking of the points we just made. Also assume that this is a standard 1.6 millimeter thick PCB. Here's another image of this four layer stack up, and this time I've drawn in the approximate dielectric thicknesses. Between layer one and layer two, we typically have a thin prepreg, same thing between layer three and four. However, between layer two and three, we have this rather thick core, which can be, you know, just under a millimeter. Now remember our points that we want good coupling and close planes. So this standard four layer stack up isn't that great, assuming a 1.6 millimeter thick PCB for several reasons. First of all, the good reasons is that L1 and L2 and L3 and L4 have fairly decent references if constructed correctly, so we have a thin dielectric between signal and ground, for example. However, between layer 2 and layer 3, which is our power planes, we have little coupling and therefore have pretty bad capacitance, so this is pretty useless, so to speak. Also, the reference for L4, which is the power plane directly below, isn't that great. We need to ensure that the power plane voltage then matches the source voltage for all of the signals on layer four. The question is also if we have different sections of our power plane, we have splits in the reference, we have signals that have to be carefully routed over these little islands, so this isn't a great idea. Also a question is what happens when we change, for example, from layer one with a via, we have this ground plane as a reference, to layer four, and then we suddenly change reference, what happens to the return path? And similarly from L4 to L1. So taking this into account, let's try and improve this stack up. The simplest way of doing that is replacing the power plane on layer three with a ground plane. This is assuming, of course, it's okay to route power on traces, so fairly low speed designs. So what does this mean? It means that L1 still has its great reference plane directly below on the ground plane, but now L4 also has a similarly great reference plane with L3 being ground. Also, any power traces now rooted on the signal layers will have a ground reference really closely coupled. But we still have that question of how do we maintain a good return path when we change, for example, from signal layer one to signal layer down here at the bottom, or vice versa. And this brings me nicely to the point of return or transfer vias. So every time we change a signal layer with a via, so we go from this signal layer to this signal layer or the other way around, we still need to consider the return path. We still want close coupling. So when changing layer, so when changing L1 to L4, for example, we change from L2 as a reference to L3 as a reference. During this transition, so this z-axis movement through the via, we need to maintain a good return path, and this is where these transfer vias come to place. So you place a ground via, as shown here, very close to the signal via. So the signal energy, as it's doing its z-axis transition, will couple to the adjacent ground via. The higher the bandwidth is of our signal, the closer this return or transfer via needs to be placed to the signal via. Here are some additional stack up tips. The first being that putting power layers close to the high speed ICs, if they're mounted on the top or the bottom of the PCB, is a good thing. We want to minimize all these via lengths and inductances, and this will improve the power delivery. Also having adjacent signal layers aren't a great idea. Remember there will be fields around these traces, and these fields will couple, cause crosstalk noise and so on. For stack ups with multiple ground layers, remember our transfer vias, and these should be treated as equally as important as signal vias, but also don't forget to stitch these ground planes together to maintain similar potentials across these different ground planes. We also need to consider what happens when we change from certain layers, especially for high speed designs, for example, from an outer layer to some sort of inner layer. We'll generate some sort of via stub, which could be very problematic, so it might be good to change from an outer layer to another outer layer. Another option is back drills, but these are fairly expensive. In essence, when designing a stack up, just follow the simple rule to have a minimum of one ground reference layer closely adjacent to any signal or power layer, and you should be pretty safe to begin with. So finally, let me show you some good multi-layer stack ups to kind of summarize our thoughts. First of all, we already looked at this four layer stack up with signal and two ground planes. We have great references because we have thin dielectrics between signal and ground either side. And we have good references for top and bottom signal layers. Of course, this does mean you have to root power. For six layers, we do something similar. We have a signal, top and bottom, a ground plane adjacent to both those signal layers. But internally, we can also have this sort of strip line signal layer with a ground and power plane as reference. Nicely now, we also have a power plane, which means we don't have to root power. As you can see, every one of these signal power layers has a ground plane directly next to it, and this is very important. We can extend the, this idea to eight and 10 layers, and as you can see, I'm simply adding ground and signal layers to extend the stack up, at least maintaining one ground layer adjacent to any signal or power plane. 
Of course, you can use multiple power plans if this is what your project requires. Lastly, I can't recommend this video enough by Rick Hartley on how to achieve proper grounding, and he talks about many of these principles I showed you in this video in detail of how to design proper stack ups and what's important in high speed PCB design. So, thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you liked the video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, and if you haven't already, please do click the subscribe button, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye bye.